Welcome to In Context. This is The War Report. My name is Ken McDermott Rowe, and I'm here with my fellow host, Gus Cantavero, and our military affairs commentator, Marshawn McDermott Rowe. In order to fully understand American strategy in the global wars, you have to know something about a very important Islamic sect called the Wahhabis. So let's get right into it, Marshawn. Who are the Wahhabis and what role do they play in America's global wars? Well, Wahhabism as an ideology was founded by a man named Sheikh Mohammed ibn Abdul Wahhab, who lived from 1703 to 1792, quite a long time ago. He founded um, a ideology based on the purification of Islam. Uh, the idea was his main principles were to fight what is known as shirk and bidah. Shirk being polytheism, bidah being the Arabic word for innovation. Now, when he looked at what was happening in the Islamic world at the time, the Ottoman Turks were the heads of the caliphate, the Islamic State, and they were, um, they were as he saw them, decadent. They were corrupt. They were adopting Western ways. They had, uh, you know, there was alcohol in the palaces, and the guys had more wives than were Islamically allowed. And so he felt that, you know, Islam must return to, return to a pure form of a purer form of Islam, its fundamentals. Ibn Abdul Wahhab took it much further. He took a very literal interpretation of the Quran and a very selective interpretation of certain Islamic verses, things like um, wiping out polytheism or wiping out innovation extended to anyone who did not adhere specifically to his brand of Islam. And this included other Muslims as well. This includes everyone from different schools of thought within Sunni Islam to the entirety of the Shia Muslim world. So Wahhabis, Wahhabis are uh, uh, Sunnis, and where is their, geographically their stronghold? Geographically, their stronghold is in Saudi Arabia, and this comes because Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was instrumental in the establishment of the first Saudi kingdom. Many people think that the first Saudi kingdom was established in uh, post-World War One. This is actually not the case. The first Saudi kingdom was established in the 1790s, uh, was known as the Kingdom of Dirihya. Dirihya. So they're not a fringe group in Saudi Arabia. They are Saudi Arabia is a is a Wahhabi kingdom. It is. It's a very old Wahhabi roots, and um, because its kings were brought to power by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and because of his obedience to the Wahhabi cause or his obedience to the Saudi cause, Wahhabism was made the main school of thought. And ever since then, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's descendants have been the Grand Muftis, the religious leaders, if you will, of Saudi Arabia. So, so can you talk about the connection between the Wahhabis and the Taliban? The Taliban in, uh, brought about an interpretation of Islam very similar to that of what, what we see in Saudi Arabia. They adhere to Wahhabism, and they utilized that in the creation of their state when they toppled the uh, after the toppling of the communist government, when the Taliban toppled the warlords and brought together the unity of the country. They implemented this very rigid interpretation. And the Taliban of in law. Afghanistan was an outgrowth of some Wahhabi. Based schools in on the Afghan Pakistan area. Yes, no. There's a lot of myths surrounding the tal creation of the Taliban. What had happened is um, Mullah Omar, who's currently the head of the Taliban, although nobody's seen him uh, in a very long time. At least we haven't. He uh, was a sheikh in a small town in Afghanistan. A sheikh being a religious leader in Islam, and he. There had been rumor that these two girls had been captured and they were being raped by this warlord. So Mullah Omar gets a couple of his students together and they went with like six Kalashnikovs and killed the warlord and recaptured the girls. And, you know, it's wonderful, glorious, you know, thing. How much of it's true? Who knows? But he created this myth around him and around his students. Taliban is an Arabic word for students. They were called the Talib, Taliban. And we have here an iconic image of the Taliban. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Something and, that the uh, average American would think of when you mention Taliban. It's just a bunch of guys sitting in the back of a pickup truck with Kalashnikovs. <laughs> exactly. And when you look at their style of clothing, that is I I indicative of the Wahhabi doctrine in that, you know, Western... It's very traditional. Very traditional. Western yeah. clothing is wrong. Anything that could be considered modernist. So, like in the rest of the Muslim world, a woman wears a headscarf and mm -hmm. can wear pretty much any kind of modest-looking Western clothing. Men are encouraged to do the same. Uh, not Obviously not the scarf, but to encourage to dress modestly. In Wahhabism, it becomes a crime to dress anything other than what is enforced by the uh, what they call the... Moral police actually is there's an actual police force in Saudi Arabia called the Mor Morality Police. Wow. Now somehow morality the, advice. I'm the, sorry. Now the Mujahideen in uh, in Afghanistan, with whom we were allied in the 80s against the Soviets, that they had some Wahhabi connection or no? To an extent, the Mujahideen, which means um, soldiers of faith, 
you know, com- commonly misinterpreted as soldiers of God, soldiers of faith. They, um, they're they volunteer soldiers that came from all across the Muslim world. They weren't inherently Wahhabi. They, Some of them adhered to the Wahhabi ideology, but the reason why Afghanistan slipped into this Wahhabi spiral was because the Mujahideen, after they defeated the Soviets, went, we need a government. And the Americans, our response, as very typical of our nature, was to say, see ya. Soviets were gone. Our, we had no interest in the region. So the Mujahideen had no capability of establishing a government. Mm-hmm. So what had happened is the, um, the ta- they, they collapsed and devolved into the civil war. Because it was the, never really our goal to modernize the country. It was our goal to kick the Soviets out so they wouldn't threaten India. So, so that Afghanistan falls under the Taliban, which is connected to the Wahhabis. They are How, Wahhabis. So they are Wahhabis. How does this connect then to Al Qaeda? Well, Al Qaeda, being a militantly Wahhabi organization, was given refuge by the Taliban. The, the Al Qaeda seeks refuge with predominantly Wahhabi countries. This would be a Wahhabi government. So this would be places like Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan. Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and of course the government in Bahrain. Our lovely ally, King Ham- King Hamed of Bahrain, um, provides protection to the Al-, Al Qaeda. Presumably, the same guys who blew up, allegedly blew up the World Trade Center. Which is bringing us now to this anomalous situation where we are the sworn enemies of Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Indeed, in the new National Defense Authorization Act, civilians can be arrested and put in military prisons for cooperating with the Taliban and the and Al Qaeda. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we find our staunchest ally in the uh, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, as a Wahhabi kingdom. A blatant uh, well, contradiction. Blatant contra- you've got the Bar- Bahrain, which I, get, I understand is also a Wahhabi kingdom. Again, that's the site of our, uh, our our fleet in the area is based. In, in Bahrain. It's the, the, the height of hypocrisy is that we talk about the, the need to spread democracy and um, the, the need to spread uh, the American values. And if the American values are what we're spreading, boy, I we're sure don't want to be part of it. Because the people that we've been backing, the Islamic Fighting Group in Libya, the National Transitional Council, they are Al Qaeda affiliated Wahhabi militants who are enslaving and murdering the African Muslims that live there. And then in places, of course, like Bahrain, King Hamed's in the business of murdering his own people. He's an apartheid state where the Shia majority population is oppressed and not given equal rights to the minority Sunni and predominantly Wahhabi segments of the population. Well, if we go back to Libya, it's, it appears that we made an alliance with this Wahhabi al-Qaeda associated group, the, the Islamic fighting group in Libya, in order to overthrow our enemy Gaddafi, who was overthrown, I believe, because of his long-term friend, friendship with, the, with and as, Russia. And as proof of that, there's photos uh, of al-Qaeda flag flying over the courthouse in, in Libya, uh, in the capital, after the overthrow which is a black flag with uh, some Arabic with the, words, with the words um la 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 muhammad rasulullah which is the um, profession of islamic faith which means there is no god but god uh, muhammad right. is the messenger mm-hmm. but it's and that do we have a photo of that fellow who is now the, we put in charge of tripoli the military district there he is okay that gentleman Okay. Uh, Belhaj, Belhaj, who has MI6 connections to London and was we, was was the front for the West's uh, intelligence operations in Libya to ensure that uh, our banking interests and oil interests were overseen. The first thing that they did in Benghazi was set up an a, a, a independent private central bank. Right. What revolutionary group <laughs> sets up a private <laughs> bank as their first order of business? So it was the neo-colonial well, rule in conjunction with al-Qaeda. And the interesting thing is we, the U.S. government likes the Wahhabis because, for two reasons. One, they hold no actual popular support. The Qaddafi had actually a fair amount of popular Very support. much like our own government. Like, yeah, yeah, so, you know, we're just, we're, we, all we have to do is start sure. waiting for the morality and vice police to come arrest us. And, you know, it's, <laughs> the fact is, though, that we like them because they have no popular support. So it's not going to be the mainstream Muslims. And this is something i got to emphasize. Mainstream Sunni Muslims do not adhere to Wahhabism and they do not support the Wahhabi ideology. But that's why backing them is so brilliant. They will never have a revolution that will spread beyond the region we give the guys... But it could be very useful in cases such as Iraq, where you have now a Shiite-dominated government that we, I believe, we want to destabilize. Well, that's point number two. The you're jumping ahead. Stop. Well, (laughs) yeah, exactly. I'm getting there. Don't worry. You know, have to have to move at you know steady pace. It's you know a lot to cover. But the um the we back them because they're militantly anti-Shia, and they're anti-Shia to the point they believe that all the Shia must be exterminated. Now the Shia are another school of thought in Islam. You have four schools of thought within Sunni Islam, and then you have the Shia, which are a different school of thought. 
And they all adhere, the Sunnis and the Shia, to the same doctrine. The only difference is small, small doctrinal differences, small differences on jurisprudence, exact same theology. It's the power of Muhammad passed to the stepson, the, the son-in-law versus the nephew or something like that? Uh, well, yeah, it's uh, whether, whether it would be passed to the, whether the caliphate should have gone through the bloodline of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The, uh, as the Shiites believe. As the Shiites believe, through Ali ibn Ali, Ibn, uh, Ibn Talib, and then to you know his son, his sons Hassan, Hossein, and to their descendants, you know through a, a bloodline, or whether the the caliph should have been um, nominally elected. Although there is a, you know there is a lot of um, there was a civil war that ensued afterwards, and most Sunnis will agree that you know Hossein should have been the caliph, but you know the uh, the. He lost, so that the Shia became a minority, and the Sunnis, who were at the time led by Muawiyah, became the the dominant. Mm -hmm. So the, the difference between the Sunnis and the Shias are more dynastic than theological. It's dynastic and my, like I say, minor doctrinal differences. And the Wahhabis are positioned as a small but very militant group within the Sunni Sunni community. There, there are Wahhabis who actually say it was good that Muawiyah killed Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. And, you know, they say that it was good that he was murdered at Karbala because, you know, we must wipe out the Shia. It is a completely un-Islamic value. And that's why you must not mistake the Wahhabis for being, you know, for practicing the true Islam because they don't. They are militant to the point that it is at variance with all Islamic teaching. So, right. so, so to step back then, what it seems is we exploit this nominal mm -hmm. enemy group. The, or driving a wedge and giving them guns in order divide to Divide and conquer while un, we're telling the American people, oh, we're against Al-Qaeda, we're, we're against the Taliban. Meanwhile, we actually support the violence. Wahhabi groups that are allied with Al-Qaeda. I once Taliban. asked you, um, don't the Al-Qaeda Wahhabists know that they're being used by the West since they are our convenient surrogate puppet in the region to go and be a boogeyman anywhere this, that it suits us. And what was your response to that? Well, actually, it's interesting because they believe, they know that they're being used by the United States. But part of the Wahhabi ideology is before we fight the kafir, which is Arabic word for unbelievers, which would include, you know, the Israelis and, yeah. you know, the Americans and all the rest of it. Before we go and fight them, we have to eliminate the bidah the innovation. We have to eliminate the shirk, the polytheism from Islam. We have to purify. One of the principles of uh, Wahhabism is purify Islam to its purest, most fundamental form, and then we can turn and fight the unbelievers. Now, in order, if that means we have to ally ourselves, and again, this is a very un-Islamic principle, we have to ally ourselves with the unbelievers, as it were, quote-unquote, or those that are waging war against Muslims. That's fine, as long as it, they wage war against the right Muslims. As long as, if they're waging war against the Shia, and this is a very, again, un-Islamic principle, the idea that a Muslim should turn his gun on another Muslim is haram. It's, for, it's, it's the Arabic word for forbidden. It's forbidden in Islam to turn your guns on another Muslim. Mm -hmm. But the Wahhabis are believe, and this is why we work very well with them, they believe that it's okay to work with the Americans as long as we're fighting against the Shia, those evil Shia. Shia. And of course... So they're know, making exceptions to their own rules in order to play priorities. Exactly. You know? And it works It works very well for us. And the you know, same reason why fundamentally we do want a Wahhabi state in um, Egypt. We want a Wahhabi state in Libya. We want a Wahhabi state in Saudi Saudi Arabia. We want a Wahhabi state in, Talib in um, Afghanistan because it will hem in Iran. Which is the real enemy and it puts to lie this notion that's constantly you hear on the network TV that we're promoting democracy in the Mideast. It has I, nothing to do with that. I think that. it also guarantees that we'll have a future intervention by putting in the most least, least reliable people in, in command because then we're going to guarantee that they're within five years, there's going to be another humanitarian but need to intervene. You know, right? keep yeah. the region a basket case. Yeah, because most course. Muslims, the vast majority, there are over one billion Muslims alive in the world today and growing, and most don't want to live in a Wahhabi state. You probably say a good 98% do not want to live in a Wahhabi state. Mm -hmm. So you ensure that there will never be a stability. And that's why... Uh, the U.S. media is taking, it's very hypocritical because they're taking a very bad outlook to, oh, Islamists are getting in power in Egypt, you know, the, and, and in Iran, the, you know, the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei is, you know, Islamic fundamentalists. And then we back fundamentalists in Libya because in Egypt they have an Islamic democracy led by the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan Muslimin, which is not as militant as the Taliban is. And in Iran, they have a modern Islamic state where women can work, women can participate in government. I mean, the, in Libya, they've taken away women's rights. And in Iran, 
there was uh, that women have held members of been members of parliament and ministries. Right. So well, I guess so, we have to understand that our government plays realpolitik just like the Romans did when they conquered Gaul. It's the same old story: divide and conquer again. Maybe one day we'll have a, a new foreign policy based on traditional concepts of mutual respect for other nations and non-interference. But in the meantime, I think it's really eternal. really important the American people understand what's beneath this veneer of democracy building and uh, and uh, wanting to support good government find out what's really going on. So thank you for joining us. We'll continue to follow this. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Find us on Facebook. Like us. Visit the blog and contactreport.com. All the rest. Support us if you can. All right. Talk to you soon. Keep Bye. watching. Bye-bye.